guy this morning already checked out. That's a lot of trust. Well, but PayPal, I'm sorry, eBay and PayPal, they own, eBay owns PayPal, so they govern the whole process. So if I don't deliver the item and all that stuff, yeah, I mean, they, they control it. So eBay can just debit my PayPal account. Huh? Yeah. Never wondered why that's the preferred uh, payment method. <laughs> you know how PayPal takes fees? You know, you know how eBay takes fees? Everybody's getting fees, <laughs> and they're all coming back to eBay. It's convenient. Well, when I, well, it's safe. Well, when I first started working at a company, we got all these invoices in for orders, and all these credit card numbers are there. I'm like, these people just trust me to enter these in, right? Mm-hmm. But, but PayPal, like PayPal, PayPal charges higher fees. Yeah. So and that's the trade-off. You're you're having a trusted third party handle it um, at a little bit more cost. But the reality is, is how much more cost? It's a couple of bucks on, you know, a a you know hundred dollar purchase. So from an individual transaction, a very small percentage. But we consider the number of transactions PayPal handles. It's a multi billion dollar business off. One in two dollar transactions. So pretty. The swipe credit card thing for iPhone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's free too. Well, they give it to you. They'll send it to you for free, but it's like a one percent, twenty five percent. It's the same. It's the PayPal fee. It's yeah. it's it doesn't. It allows you to take in person PayPal cards. Like, don't want people to have to pay you by email address. Now you can have PayPal run your entire business. <laughs> have an iPad, slide the card, point of sale, done. Well, it's, I mean, it, I guess it is genius from that perspective. And actually, if you really think about it, um, how many? I, I'm actually interested. I wonder how many employees PayPal has. I bet you they're not that big of a company on paper because they have no brick and mortar. Um, as from my interactions with them, they have very few customer service representatives. <laughs> I mean, this might be a group of like 30 or 40 people at PayPal. Probably most of which are accountants or something who are handling all the transactions and making things go into the right buckets and all that stuff. So you might have a relatively small company that's making all that money. It's pretty legit. Okay, so... Um, I think I asked you yesterday, to, or sorry, on uh, uh, Monday, to, uh, we were talking about distributed operating systems, to think about, um, what was the question? Think about other pros and cons of distributed operating systems. Oh, oh no, I remember what I asked you. To. I asked you to consider if you, what would it take for you to be willing to give up your um, a percentage of your idle CPU time and your idle hard drive cycles and things like that um, to be part of this distributed operating system. Because we mentioned last time that one of the issues is you're paying for that electricity. Uh, I think Dane used the example of I'll let somebody borrow my car as long as I can borrow their car and I use more gas. <laughs> He's coming out ahead. But if you think about this as being kind of a global model where it's, you know, it, to, to an extent it's out of your hands. Like, if I'm going to use Dane CPU, it wouldn't be me saying, oh, I'm going to use Dane CPU. It would be me working within the distributed operating system, doing something, and the distributed operating system de determines how to distribute my work to whether it's one additional person's computer or two to two additional people's computer, whatever it is. The operating system does it. So it's going to be anonymous. So it's not like me and Dane having this agreement where I'm using his CPU. But in order to participate in that ecosystem where you, I mean, it's, it's very much like BitTorrent, right? At least for a short period of time. You know, with BitTorrent, you uh, can enjoy the benefits of downloading from uh, a bunch of sources, a bunch of seeds, as long as you're also uploading. Until you're done with your download and you immediately cut it, on, cut it off. But you, you know what I'm saying, right? So um, what would it take to convince you to participate in that. It would be the, the point system that you mentioned last time. As long as I'm either breaking even or coming out a little bit ahead, then I would do it. It might not be that transparent. I mean, it might be one of those things where it's like, 
Um, I mean, I, I, I guess it, it might not be as cut and dry as that. It might not be clear to you that you're either coming out ahead or breaking even or coming close to breaking even. You know, it might just be kind of a generalistic statement of fairness. Like you feel like it's pretty fair. Um, but do you necessarily, I mean, so think about some other models, though, in the world where people are willing, I mean, we were just talking about it. People are willing to pay a premium for a service they trust. So Dane's willing to use PayPal even though their fees are higher because he trusts that over what he sees people just giving him pieces of paper with credit card numbers written on it. And that makes sense, right? Um, so given that, uh, what would it take for you to think that the benefits you get from the service, the additional processing power, is worth participating in sharing your processing power? Ultimately, it's going to start with this. How many of you perceive that things that you do on your computer might take too long? That you could use some additional horsepower? Well, we have to think about it. What things take a long time on our computer? Everything. <laughs> Everything takes a long time on your computer. Okay. computer itself. So you have something on your computer. Um, so for instance, let's, um, I, I think, well, we're going to kind of get to the point that you just started making with network speeds today, but um, do we have a perception, generally speaking, that our computers are too slow? I would say generally speaking, no. We don't really have that perception, do we? Do we have the perception that our computers are too expensive? Let's go that route. If you're buying a brand new computer today that has the power that you want it to have, is that a pretty expensive computer? Let's say price was no object for you. What computer would you get today? Probably one of the Macs. Just, just randomly one of the Macs? That's so detailed. The MacBook Pro. Uh, no, you gotta go up and get the Mac. Uh, the, the Mac Pro the tower? tower? I won't get yeah. the tower because you can't use it. Okay, so you get a high-end MacBook Pro. Yeah. Okay, so you... They don't make 17 inches. 15. They make 15 inches. Do you know anything about computers? A little bit. Because it seems like if you have your friends coming to you to fix their computer and you don't know anything about computers... I fixed it, though. I have no problem with it. Thank you, YouTube. <laughs> wow. Okay, so we would probably... I mean... So you're saying you want to have a high-end mobile machine that you can take with you. Some other people might say, I want a high-end desktop machine. But if money was no object, you're going to get the most powerful computer you can get, right? Now, how long is that most powerful computer still the most powerful computer? Probably a month. <laughs> 20, 20 minutes? <laughs> 20 minutes and something else is out? You know, whatever it is, it's a relatively short period of time, right? So uh, you almost have immediate, I mean, not buyer's remorse, but you immediately could have gotten something better for a very similar price. So would, we, would it be preferred if we lived in a world where our computers were all of relatively fixed cost and relatively inexpensive with the understanding that the additional horsepower that we need when we need it is available through the distributed operating system. So if you knew you basically had unlimited computing power with, I mean, let's, let's take uh, my MacBook Air as an example. So I use this machine all the time. It does literally everything that I want it to do with one exception. If I'm going to convert movies, I'm not going to do it on a MacBook Air because it will take a month. I'll do it on my Mac Pro at home because it'll take six minutes. That's a problem that you see the difference in computing power. Other than that, this guy's fast enough to do everything I want it to do. Um, maybe the trade-off is screen size, things like that. But we're just talking about performance. Just talking about performance. This machine is, is fast enough for 95% of the stuff I might want to do. For that other 5%, I wish it had more horsepower. Well, I have multiple machines that I could go to that have more horsepower. Well, what if you had a machine along these lines where 95% of the time you could do everything you needed to do? Just throwing a percentage out there. But for that other 5% of the time, rather than going and having to spend extra money on a more powerful computer, 
or knowing somebody that you can take your stuff over to them, you know, who has a more powerful computer. All you had to do was say, oh, I'm going to do this. And your machine, the operating system, would recognize that, oh, this would be better to take to the cloud. And it would automatically take something that on this machine might take, you know, let's say 10 hours to convert a big video. And it can do it in seven minutes using the cloud. That would be something that it's going to take to the cloud, as opposed to, I'm going to open up a Word document. Well, that's going to open just fine on this machine, <laughs> plenty fast, right? So if every one of your computers was $300, let's say that a computer was a computer, and it was $300, and it had a baseline performance thing. So think about, like, you know, you're, you know, keeping some of these conversations relative to what's happening in the world right now. Let's take something like the PS4 or the Xbox One. Those machines have, these are the first new releases in eight years for those. So that means over the last eight years, everybody who's playing Xbox 360 is using the identical speed hardware. The boxes have gotten, you know, they, they put it, they, what do they have the Xbox Slim that's a little thinner than the other one, but the hardware inside is actually the same hardware. Why? Well, do you think that hardware today is cheaper than the hardware was eight years ago? Absolutely. What does that mean? Microsoft's merging those up to make more money off each individual unit. So they probably had a fairly even keel for profit from those units across the years because early on they sold a zillion of them at a smaller margin because the parts were expensive. Last year they sold, you know, an eighth of a zillion, but the margins were a lot higher. So they probably made, let's just call it roughly the same amount of money. So what if our computers had the exact same horsepower in them for eight years straight. That's not the way it works today, right? The way it works today is, you know, if you buy a computer six months later, you can go out and for the same money get another computer that's faster, right? Well, just let's say that all of our computers were the same speed for uh, an eight-year period, kind of the Xbox 360 model. Yet, all of them were linked together. So, None of us could even fathom a problem that would be too much work for a zillion Xbox 360s linked together with its current horsepower. Does that make sense? Now, for those of you who have an Xbox 360 or a PS3, for most things, is it still pretty fast? Yeah, still feels plenty fast, even though it's eight-year-old technology. If you had an eight-year-old computer, I mean, that computer is less than eight years old, isn't it? Four. It's only four years old, and it's garbage. Why? Why is it garbage? What operating system are you running on there? I'm running seven. Okay. Was seven out when that thing came out? Just came Just out. came out? That was one of the special, special deals I got with it. Oh, so it came with seven? Yeah. So that thing's garbage running the operating system it came with? No. Would you pay 150 bucks for it? No. I have no clue. Like, I was it cheap? Actually, no. So I've got an i5 in here, so it's like, I think it's about 700. Well, it's not bad. It's like middle, middle so road. I got it colored. I've got a, I got a machine. So it's just crap. It was hmm. good, and then I just, over the years, it's taking a lot of abuse. Hmm. I don't handle the share. <laughs> well, in any case, so let's say we all had that baseline machine and you didn't need to buy a new machine every year, or every two years, or every three years. Let's say you could buy a machine every eight years, and that machine cost you 300 bucks. So 300 bucks split over eight years is not a lot per year, right? Okay, so that's what, 150 over four, 75 over two, so that's like 30, 37.50 a year for a computer. How many of you would pay $37.50 per year for a computer if you knew it was always going to be the latest, greatest technology. In a heartbeat, right? Okay. So, we're all going to get a machine of this, of this speed. Um, we're each going to pay 300 bucks for it up front. We have it now. I mean, heck, they'll probably have, you'll, you would probably have companies, just like cable companies, that lease them to you. 50 bucks a month. Or 50 bucks a year, sorry. Maybe a hundred bucks a year, so you don't have to drop three hundred bucks today, but we want ten dollars a month from you, eight ninety five a month from you, in perpetuity. <laughs> um, 
So, I mean, you wouldn't even have to spend 300 day one. You have to spend eight bucks. You get the latest, greatest computer. And eight bucks the next month. And eight, eight bucks the next month. Forever. But if you could have that and know that you had all the processing power you ever would need, would that be worth it? Why? Well, I guess, number one, it, it would kind of put Intel and AMD kind of out of business. And I think they would try to, they wouldn't keep trying to push the market and create better and better products. So you'd always stay at this lower quality product. I mean, they, not, they wouldn't try to compete against each other for lower prices. So they come with a steady price for or a higher price for people's product. Okay. So you're thinking more from a, a, a business perspective for the competitors. That it would be bad for the competition because they no longer have a reason to innovate. Um, okay. I mean, it's probably reasonable, though, to assume that there would be big business opportunities. Maybe Intel and AMD would actually I mean, so you have this network of computers that are all webbed together, but then you probably have a bunch of supercomputers that is part of the cloud service, if you will, that they always need to be up to date for the latest, greatest things, I guess, something like that. You know, with that in mind, then maybe Intel would still have a reason to come up with those faster chips, but their, their customers are not the consumers who are buying computers at five or 600 bucks a pop. Their customers are the um, large companies or the uh, uh, countries, things like that, that are, that are partnering to support the cloud support the performance. So let's assume that they didn't go out of business. They still had a reason to come up with, you know, better and better and better things, that kind of, that kind of crap. Um, and the reality is, let's, let's just say, so kind of going down that route, I'm saying that we all go out and get a computer today for 300 bucks. Well, let's say a year from now, somebody goes out and gets a computer. Maybe the computer a year from now is a better computer, but it's still 300 bucks. But is there a reason for me to go out and get that better computer? Probably not. Why? Because I have all the processing power I might need. So the only time a person would actually want to upgrade their computer or need to upgrade their computer is when things that usually happen locally, as new software, new versions of Word come out, things like that, no longer run well on your base hardware. And we look at Xbox as an example where the software for Xbox 360 that came out three months ago runs just as well as the software for Xbox 360 that came out seven years ago. Right? And really, the graphics haven't changed drastically. So, I mean, that model could, could persist, where we wouldn't need to get a new computer because we are leveraging everybody else's stuff. Now, in Dane's argument, though, maybe the bigger problem is the people who are making the software, not the people who are making the hardware. Because now, they have to play to that lowest common denominator. So... You know, that's what you're seeing with Xbox. So based on the technology we have available today, are we expecting the Xbox One games and the PS4 games to be a giant leap forward in capabilities and graphics and crap like that from the 360 games and the PS3 games? We are expecting it, aren't we? Because the hardware is there to support it. Before, the lowest common denominator between those two was Xbox 360. So every game that was available for, for both uh, both platforms were made for Xbox 360 and then ported to the PS3 because they had to play to that lowest common denominator of performance. Well, now they have a lowest common denominator of performance between the two, which is much closer, but way, 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 way faster than what they were dealing with eight years ago, right? So the machine that's coming out, you know, that's, that came out last week and coming out this week are way faster than the machines from eight years ago. Tons more performance. So now they can play to that lowest common denominator. So if we take that as our example, the software makers, so let's say Microsoft Word, or the video game makers, things like that, now they're like, okay, well, our games, our PC games, need to run on the lowest common denominator hardware. So maybe the eight-year-ago $300 computer somebody bought. Somebody bought. <laughs> that somebody bought. Um, now you might have some some crippling innovation in the video game type area. Is that a huge deal? I mean, it seems to work okay in the uh, uh, Xbox and uh, PlayStation world. 
PC gamers, they go out and get these crazy gaming rigs that can run the computers. I mean, the games are, for PC have tunable graphics, right? You know, turn all a bunch of crap off if you want this to run on your computer. And then some guy goes out and gets an Alienware or whatever and has everything maxed out. I mean, isn't, wasn't that the big deal with, like, the PC version of Battlefield? Things like that, that people who are big into the, um, the war simulation stuff, they would go get a giant, you know, PC gaming rig that could run the thing in real time where PlayStation and uh, Xbox had to dumb it down based on their performance and network and all that other crap. So maybe that's, maybe that's the better argument for losing innovation is at the software level uh, than the hardware level. I think the hardware probably exists, but the software is maybe where we get hurt more. Um, now, with that argument in mind, though, we're starting to see a lot of companies take their software into the cloud. You know, uh, Apple has a, uh, has a web-based version of iWork. So you can use numbers online. You can use uh, um, Keynote online. You can use pages online. So that's Word, Excel, and uh, uh, PowerPoint, their equivalents. Microsoft has an online version of Excel, Word, and PowerPoint uh, through their SharePoint. Um, service. Uh, and I think they're also coming out with online versions just for everybody else. But if you're a SharePoint subscriber, there's already an online thing. So you can manage your shared Excel documents in the cloud through a web browser that's running Excel in a web browser. You know, it might be a little bit of a dumbed down version of Excel, but not seemingly. I mean, you can, it seems like you can do most of everything in it. So we're already starting, starting to see companies take our applications into the cloud. So if Microsoft Word is in the cloud, how are we experiencing it on our computer? How do we experience Microsoft Word on our computer if it's in the cloud? We go to a web we go to a website, right? Well, is the horsepower that's running Microsoft Word is that on our machine? No. That's magically someplace else. Right? What are we seeing? We're seeing pretty pictures that are updating. So we're seeing a technology similar to Flash. It's probably HTML5 today. So something that your web browser knows how to interpret, knows how to make things move around and that kind of stuff. But from, from a computational complexity perspective, all your computer is doing is showing graphics. Showing graphics and passing keystrokes and mouse clicks around. How... Uh, how much data am I transferring to the cloud if I'm do passing it keystrokes and mouse clicks? Very little, right? So if we play online games before, so pick your favorite MMO or something like that, or favorite uh, uh, first-person shooter, uh, take Halo. Halo is an example. Um, so that's a, I, I have played Halo very little, but my understanding is it's a game you play first-person shooter, you're on a map with a zillion other real people have a couple teams, something like that, maybe, what, there's 20 people at a time, something like that, whatever it is. It, yeah, we're, we're in the right realm here, right? Okay. So these are people who are sitting in their living rooms, all playing Halo on their Xbox 360, yet you're experiencing, so if Dane and I are playing each other, he's in his living room, I'm in my living room, not the same living room, because that would be creepy. Um <laughs> Because I'm actually in, <laughs> I'm in Voltage's living room. It's not creepy, okay? He's got a supply of beverages. <laughs> Ener energy drinks. <laughs> Plus, we'll have the extra adrenaline we need if we need to fight off looters. <laughs> so anyways, um, we're both playing this game. And when Dane moves on the screen or shoots on the screen, I see it on my screen, right? And are you at least decent at those games? Okay, so I would be dead, because I'm nowhere near decent at those games. I would say if there's something less than noob, that's me. I'm at that level. So my plan is, is I'm going to get Battlefield 4 for the PlayStation 4 after I fe finish beating Knack, and I'm going to get awesome at it. Huh? All the little kids that play on like a 10-year-old noob. I bet you they're better than me. I get so, I, it's, it's bad. It's well, that's what I'm saying. I, I'm going to focus on one game at a time. So after I beat Knack, I'm like, I think I'm about halfway through Knack, a little more than halfway through Knack for the PS4. 
then I think I'm going to get Battlefield 4 and just go savant on it. Okay. Well, that's what I'm, I'm just going to ask what I'm going to focus on. I thought my PlayStation 4 died last night. <laughs> Things are three days old. It's already on hospice. <laughs> I, I loaded up my saved game of Knack, and I would get like 15 seconds into it, and then the screen would just lock up, and the TV made a really bad noise, like the, out, the sound output. Something with the PS4 was locking up. Did it two or three times in a row. And I had to keep like hard rebooting the PS4. So I decided, okay, well, let's see if it's if it's just this game. So I went into another game that I, you know, something I downloaded off the PlayStation Store or whatever. That seemed to work fine, no problem. Went into Knack, started a brand new game, seemed to work fine. So it ended up being um, something with the saved game. So this is actually an operating system discussion. What was happening is, is the default saved game was automatically being loaded into memory in some sort of corrupted way. So what I had to do is I had to create a new game, save that one, then switch, revert to my old save game, then it worked fine. <laughs> Operating system problem solving on PS4 Knack. So after I beat Knack, only on easy, because I'm not going to play through it again. I'm only playing easy, because I didn't want to get embarrassed. Call of Duty? Huh? Getting a Call of Duty? Call of Duty Ghost, right? Yeah. Well, I, I've... I've my understanding is those are competitors. Call of Duty and Battlefield are competitors. I'm trying to research which one people like better, and I'm leaning towards Battlefield. Battlefield is way more than they're interested. So just talking about Call of Duty, that's just kind of... Go what I've read is Call of Duty Ghosts is pretty uninventive compared to the previous Call of Duties. That doesn't mean it's bad. Yeah. yeah. So, I don't know. We can talk more after I beat Knack. Figure out which one of those I should get. But I'm leaning towards Battlefield right now. Yeah. Okay, so if you back to what we were talking mm -hmm. about, if you were to compare the processing power that it takes to run Microsoft Word on your local machine versus running it in the cloud using Eternus Core, mm -hmm. what would the computational difference be? Oh, it, it would be huge, a huge computational difference. If you are streaming Microsoft Word from the cloud, let's say, all you're doing, I mean, it's like watching Netflix. Um, so you're, you're basically, your keystrokes and your mouse clicks are getting sent to the cloud, processed, and the cloud is sending you back a image of what, you're, what should be happening. And actually, it's not even sending back an image. It's sending back, um, you know, directions to your web browser and what it should do. And this is kind of what I was getting at with, like, a game like Halo, is each of the players, so if Dane and I are playing... On my Xbox, I have the Halo application installed. The five gigabyte file with all the graphics, all the stuff it needs. On Dane's Xbox, he has the Halo application installed. All the graphics, blah, blah, blah. So everything that's flying back and forth between my computer and Dane's, uh, my Xbox and Dane's Xbox is probably going through the cloud, Microsoft Live, right? Is just information that tells Dane's version of, of Halo what to show up on his screen. Show my dude on his screen at this position, aiming his gun at Dane, blah, 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 whatever. That kind of stuff. It's not sending images. It's not sending anything else. It's selling, sending directives. You know, just in text. Bursts of data. Small, tiny bursts of data. Um, that don't get burdened by our network speeds. Because our network speeds are fast enough if you're transferring a, you know, half a K file. How long is it down? How long is it? And, and when I say half a K, that's way, way, way more information than is being transferred per second for a game like Halo. I mean, a game like Halo is probably streaming, you know, 64 bytes a second or something like that. I mean, I'm pulling a number out of the sky, but relatively small chunks of data every second. And our modern internet connections can handle that no problem. One of the things that we use to measure how, you know, how online capable our internet connection is has less to do with how fast our internet is in terms of download speed, but how fast it is in terms of latency and ping rate. Okay, so you, the, the good example of this is the worst internet for online gaming is satellite-based internet. So even though you can get satellite-based internet that can go as fast as 10 uh, megabit per second now, the ping for it is somewhere between 3,000 and 5,000, which means the time between you... If you're in a web browser at the time when you type in google.com and press enter, it's three to five seconds later before your request is received up there. 
you're playing Halo, will three and five seconds later for when you shoot, will that make a big difference? You're dead. I mean, a huge difference, right? So what do we want? We want milliseconds. You know, we want something less than 100 milliseconds. Um, you know, in fact, uh, there was a game, Counter-Strike, that and I, I mean, maybe I'm assuming some of the games today do this because Counter-Strike is significantly older, but Counter-Strike is one of the early first-person shooters, and it would actually not let you into games if your ping wasn't good enough. You had to qualify. <laughs> your internet connection had to qualify to, be, <laughs> to, to get into that game. So, you know, they say something less than... Uh, uh, three, the, the, the generalistic threshold is something less than 300 milliseconds is considered real-time. I would say most people who are real-time gamers want something south of 100 milliseconds. Um, that means that your information is getting sent and received in as close to real-time as you can expect from an internet connection, let's say at this point. Um, so that's what's really happening. When Dan and I are playing in this game, all the graphics live locally. And my graphics card is just receiving instructions from the general what to show up on my screen. And those instructions are coming in little tiny text documents, little tiny packets of information. Okay, so my local machine, my graphics card hardware is doing the work. My hard drive is doing the work. Um, and my network is doing the work. My processor is not doing the work or not doing much work. Does that make sense? It's my peripherals that are doing the work. So in a cloud-based situation, what do we need to have the newest, latest, greatest? We need enough hard drive space, fast enough hard drive, enough RAM, and a good enough graphics card. The CPU is actually a very small percentage of what um, we're actually utilizing on our computer for cloud-based applications. Um, so something for us to consider. And you're already starting to see this. Um, with some of our newer machines. And we've, we've even, t even talked about this, that I think I asked the question early on in the semester, if you had $500 to work with and you were upgrading a machine, where would you spend your money first? You know, and a lot of us were like, well, the processor, you know, really, where do you spend it first? Well, if you have enough RAM, you probably spend it on the hard drive. The hard drive is gonna be where you notice the speed the most. Then RAM. Actually, you might even, if you're a gamer, you might put video card ahead of everything. Um, then hard drive, then RAM, then power supply. <laughs> really, your CPU goes pretty far down the line. You're not going to notice a huge CPU difference on most tasks. The only time you start noticing CPU difference is in situations where the CPU is a very, very, very large part of what you're doing. And the example I always come back to with that is video conversion. You know, the faster clock speed and the more CPUs you have, the better you're going to be at, at video conversion. Um, and it's like such an easy thing to show. If I took an hour and a half movie on my MacBook Air here and I started converting it to an MP4, let's say it was an XVID and I wanted to convert it to MP4, it would be like a three hour, four hour conversion. I took that exact same movie. And so this machine's a one year old. If I took that exact same movie and went to my four-year-old Mac Pro at home, which has eight physical processors and 16 cores, um, then, uh, so basically it's a 16 processor machine, that same movie that's taken three hours in here would take six or seven minutes on that Mac Pro that's four years old. For that specific task, that kind of makes sense? That's a CPU-intensive task. Nobody is sharing my CPU at the time that I'm doing that, that conversion. So my CPUs are pinned um, during, during that, that part. So that would be an example of where you're, you're a CPU intensive thing. But watching something inside of a web browser is not CPU intensive at all. It's network intensive, just like watching Netflix. Um, it's probably slightly hard drive intensive. Um, for when you're saving, you know, so you have real-time saving and it probably caches locally in case your network drops. That way you don't actually lose anything. If you have little hiccups in your network, it probably saves locally, then pushes it out to the cloud, kind of like the, uh, um, uh, kind of like the Netflix, uh, I'm sorry, kind of like the Dropbox model where things are actually cached locally and then actually get pushed to the cloud just in case the network drops or something. Um, Is that kind of like buffering when you're watching 
Yeah, it's exactly like buffering. Uh, well, it's not exactly like buffering because buffering actually loads up in memory, not hard drive. Yeah, so, um, but it's very, it's the same principle, just speed difference because video is large. Um, where making a small Microsoft Word change is not a large file. But if you're downloading something, you know, uh, probably a Netflix, they have some HD shows, they're probably transferring at 720p is my guess. You know, that's still quite a bit of data that you're moving and loading that constantly from the hard drive is going to be expensive. You need to have that in RAM in order to be able to use it. Otherwise, you'll be constantly watching a, a, a movie and then it'll stop and then start again. You'll get like four seconds at a time. It'll be just like me watching Thor on a cam. That's a question. Say when you, so then why is it mostly intensive when you're running like a computer virus scan? Like that stuff? It wouldn't be CPU, it would just be network? No, well, computer virus scan would be hard drive. Hard drive? Oh. It's using your file system. It's searching everything on your file system. Um, that's probably very little CPU intensive. Okay. The CPU is working. It won't be completely idle because the CPU is saying, okay, now check this file, now check this file, now check this file, now check this file. But those are like little tiny, little tiny instructions. Because of the speed and the amount of things, your CPU might get a little burdened from that because it's having to give a zillion instructions very quickly because it doesn't take that long to check each individual file. Um, but I, I would call that a hard drive intensive task, not a CPU intensive task. Um, network intensive tasks would be things like Netflix. Those are clearly network intensive tasks. Um, okay, so we can certainly come up with reasons why a distributed operating system could be good. We can certainly come up with some concerns we have. You know, we don't want our software to get worse. We don't want these other things. Now, and we've already seen this in some of our mobile application stuff, like um, there is a product for uh, its iPad and iPhone that allows you to play your PC games on your iPad and iPhone. Um, and what it does is you set up the server on your PC and your iPad and iPhone talk to the server and what it's doing is it's streaming a video to you. So it's like you're watching Netflix, if you will but you're actually watching a live stream of your video game on your iPad, but you're playing it from your iPad. Does that kind of make sense? So if that was the case, now you don't even need a graphics card. Well, you don't need a great graphics card. You just have to have a graphics card capable of video playback at 1080p, let's say, for today's standards. You don't, so you don't need a better graphics card next year if everything is streamed to you as video. Does that make sense? So... If we have unlimited computational power, maybe streaming stuff to video is not a problem. Maybe that's a legitimate thing. So no, no harm, no foul. Okay, well, so this kind of segue. So we're going to say that at this point, a distributed operating system certainly seems plausible. Is that fair enough? Okay. Well, now we have some issues. All right, so let's take, um, how many of you have high-definition TV at home? Okay, high definition TV broadcasts right now are actually 1080i broadcasts. 1080, your TV is capable of 1080p, but the TV broadcasts max out at 1080i right now. And here's why 1080i is 1368 by 768. That's the resolution of 1080i. So let's do this 1368 times 768, that's that many pixels. And we're going to say that each pixel is 32 bits of color. Make sense? Four bytes. So we're going to multiply this by 32. That's number of bits. Per frame. Now we have a frame rate that we can receive. Now, um, let's say that the minimum frame rate that we need to receive for our TV is 24 frames a second, minimum. The reality is, and you've, already, you've probably seen this before, um, how many of you, when you went out and bought a TV, you got uh, 
256 hertz instead of 128 hertz or, you know, the different hertz ratings. Okay. What's the difference? What does hertz mean other than more hertz is better than less hertz? Isn't that the refresh rate? The refresh rate. How often your screen updates. Well, if you're only receiving a picture at 24 frames a second, how often does it need to update in order for you to experience 24 frames a second? 24 times per second, <laughs> right? So what do, you, what do you need 250 hertz? What do you need 120 hertz? Because oh, how many frames per second can our eyes see? Isn't it only like... Yeah, it's probably actually in the high teens or low 20s. So okay. 24 is considered to be like safe. Okay. Like your eye won't be able to tell the difference. So it's kind of overkill. This this goes back to our example for video games too. Why do you get the zi the, the zillion dollar uh, graphics card? You know, so, um, you know, uh, for me, I, like I'm playing World of Warcraft, let's say. And I'm getting, uh, with my current graphics card, I can get let's say 700 frames a second of a good graphics card. What do I need 700 frames a second for? To say you can do that, though? Well, you might think that. But here's the deal. 700 frames a second is what the graphics card is capable of displaying in a certain, like, low-end scenario. But let's say I'm in the middle of a raid with a zillion other people running around the screen and a bunch of explosions happening, a bunch of, you know... Uh, you know, magical spell effects and things like that happening on the screen, that starts bogging down the GPU, the processor on the graphics card. So maybe that 700 frames per second drops down to 140 frames per second. Does that make sense? Well, is 140 frames per second still plenty fast that I'm not going to notice? But let's say you're on a machine that, uh, a graphics card that can give you 90 frames a second. And then all of a sudden you get into a raid situation that drops to two frames a second. You'll notice. So it comes back down to that example of uh, you'd rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it. So that's why people go and get the overkill uh, graphics card. So that in their worst case scenario is better than the human eye can tell. Go ahead. So with TVs that are just trying to rip you off? Um, I would say sort of, but not, not where you really benefit from the Hertz rating is in like football and uh, basketball, sports that are hot, fast moving, and also video games. Um, so things that are fast moving, not um, documentaries and uh, sitcoms. So things that are fast moving, you're receiving, um, well, here, let, let me kind of talk about it in terms of this, because this will make sense. So this is the number of uh, bits per frame, this number right there. Well, how many, what is that in terms of bytes or gigabytes or things like that. So we're going to divide that by 8. That gets us bytes. Then we're going to divide that by 1,024. That gets us kilobytes. Then we're going to divide that by 1,024, and that gets us megabytes. Okay? So we'll just round that and say 4. So this is 4 megabytes per frame at 1080i. And we're going to say we have times 24. So that's 96 megabytes per second for 1080i. Well, how long is your, uh, let's, let's take an hour-long TV show. So times 60. That's 5,771 divided by 1,024, that's 5.6 gigabytes for a one-hour show. Now, we'll say that's uncompressed. Okay, that's 5.6 gigabytes for a one-hour show of uncompressed raw video. All right? Now, is that a lot? Seems like a lot of data. That means if you're going to watch an hour-long TV show on your, uh, at home, your cable provider needed to stream you 5.6 gigabytes for that one hour. Now the reality is they have some compression stuff. So compression is going to take advantage of the fact that many pixels that are near each other are going to look the same. 
So let's just say that they have a compression rate. Um, let's see, let's, let's get a real number. Time Warner video compression. Let's see if this gives us a real scenario so we can just have that as our starting point on Friday. I'm just going to make up a number. So let's say that they compress this to a third of its size. Just use that as the example. So we'll divide that by three. So they actually have to send 1.88 gigabytes of compressed video per hour. We'll use that as our starting point. All right. So then we'll start talking about the hertz and things like that next time. And we'll talk about what, how our, how our home base networks need to work in order to be able to receive high definition video for our video games and stuff like that. Okay. I'll see everybody on Friday.